phones of silence. Uh, so thank you all for joining us here this afternoon for the official opening of the Early Woman Artists in the White Mountains exhibit, which is located up in this corner on the second floor. I'm Ann Pillion. I'm the president of the Jackson Historical Society. It is really wonderful that we've had such an enthusiastic response to our new exhibit and interest in this program, Women in the White Mountains, to be presented by Rebecca Fullerton. I want to first thank you all for wearing your mask. And additional safety highlights, although we do not have any restrooms in the building, we do have exits. We <laughs> have one right here, a uh, fire exit, and one um, where you came, most of you came through through the yeah. front. Um, that's it. So if we have any emergency and need to leave, uh, plan, plan to use one of those too. I want to thank Hank Vinesh for video recording tonight's program. For those who cannot attend or would like to watch this presentation again, Hank will professionally produce a video that can be accessed via link. And when I get that link, we will post it on our website. It's uh, a link to access through YouTube. And um, he's done a brilliant job in the past for another program I did. And, um, you may want to check it out even right here tonight. Um, I want to thank Phil Franklin. He's the president of the Bartlett Historical Society for the kind loan of his projector and the screen and the sound system equipment, which I think we probably won't need. Um, in addition to our new exhibit upstairs, we have also begun our annual White Mountain Art Sale. On this side, we have 19th century paintings, which just turned the lights off, but we'll get those back on um, at the end of our program. And over here, we have contemporary works by Craig Altabello, he's a um, wood marquetry specialist, Eric Koppel, and Rebecca Fortune's some work of hers is hanging here and there's some right back there on the table. Um, these pieces are here on consignment and the society receives a percentage of the sale, which results in, in a significant source of revenue that supports the society's operations. Another important source comes from our membership. We thank our members, and if you have not already joined, we have some cards that you can fill out and uh, become uh, a new member, and we would uh, greatly appreciate it, and the cards are um, on the table or on the back over there on that table. I'll mention that this coming Monday um, at 7 p.m. We're, we're having a special membership meeting, and this will be a virtual meeting that will be held via Zoom. And we will be using Tin Mountain Conservation Center's Zoom platform, where Lori, the executive director, is here tonight. And um, we thank them for that. It's extra special when the other nonprofit organizations in the Valley support each other. Thank you. Before intru introducing our speaker, I want to advertise our new catalog of the early woman artists in the White Mountains. It's a beautiful catalog and a document that details the results of extensive research on the lives and accomplishments of the featured artists in here. The prof there's professional photographs of their paintings that are up in our exhibit. And also, it importantly recognizes those who assisted in making the whole collection and this catalog possible. We have it here for sale for $20. There's a stack of them, I know, in, again, in that back table, and there's some upstairs, so if nothing else, please pick it up and, and take a look. I want to recognize and thank Leslie Schumacher, who did the yeoman's work in the creation of this catalog. In who, um, uh, we also want to thank our painting sponsors, who in appreciation are listed here in the back. We have gratitude thanks for several people that worked on this and uh, gave their time and expertise. And then uh, solicitations by us for uh, people that sponsored the paintings 
in um, expenses associated with producing the catalog. I want to especially recognize and thank Jackson Historical Society's President Emeritus, Warren Schumacher, who brainstormed this idea of correcting the gender balance rep representation of the 19th and 20th century artists in our collection. Thank you, Warren. Now I'll introduce Rebecca Fullerton. Rebecca is a landscape painter and has served as archivist for the Appalachian Mountain Club since 2005. She holds a bachelor's degree in art history and studio art from Hartwood College and a master's in museum studies from the Harvard Extension School. We're very appreciative that she is here tonight to share her extensive knowledge and expertise of working in the White Mountains. Thank you, Rebecca. Hello, everyone. Thank you all so much for having me. Uh, this is, I think, a great way to open the exhibit of early White Mountain women and painters. Uh, I'm so thrilled to be doing a live event in front of actual people again. It's very exciting. <laughs> so I hope you'll enjoy. I'm going to talk not only about some of the women that are featured in the exhibition itself, so highlighting a few of them, but I'm mostly going to talk about women in the White Mountains in general, some of the trials and travails of being a girl in the hills, starting in the 19th century and working all the way up through almost to the, the current day. So I'll cover a little bit about um, the challenges they faced in terms of getting here, being here, ways that they were perceived through history, um, some of the challenges of clothing and other logistics of being a woman, especially a woman who was hiking and actively going out on the trails and exploring these beautiful white mountains. So we'll kind of cover it all and mix in art and culture and history and all of those great kinds of things. The lecture is illustrated by photos that I've taken mostly from the Appalachian Mountain Club's library and archives. So as Anne mentioned, I'm the archivist for AMC and I'm right up at Crawford Dash, uh, at the Highland Center at Crawford Dash. That's where the archives are located. So we're a research library and archives. You can come and visit and see our wonderful collections and do research into all kinds of environmental conservation and recreation topics for the White Mountains and the Northeast in general. So we'll dive right into it. So following the oops, wrong slide already. <laughs> following the exploration of the White Mountains by European transplants in the 17th and into the 18th centuries, the White Mountains would eventually become what we would consider populated. The mountains themselves were still kind of seen as, as in the way, this mass of land, this howling wilderness that was here to be conquered or bypassed. And it was seen as not a place that women would be made to go. Certainly no place for a woman, regardless, of course, of the fact that Native Americans have lived here for thousands of years, both men and women, and inhabited this region as their ancestral home. So the names of these very first White Mountain women are mostly unknown, except for a very, very few. There are women like Molly Ockett, not her actual name, which was uh, translated from the Abnaki to something like Singing Bird. She was born sometime between 1725 and 1744, and she was a skilled healer, and uh, a number of landmarks in the area, especially the Androscoggin Valley, are named after her. After Molly, the list of famous White Mountain women is pretty short, and it tends to zero in on the sad and fantastical case. You have people like Nancy Barton, who came to Jefferson around 1778 to serve at the estate of Colonel Joseph Whipple, and she ended up dying of exposure at Crawford Notch while chasing her fiance. <laughs> Not great. Lizzie Bourne became the second person and the first woman to perish on Mount Washington in 1855. 
So coming to the cold just below the summit of Mount Washington. And a monument was put up beside the Cog Railway that was there for years and years that warned visitors about the dangers of being a girl in the mountains. <laughs> The list then jumps to women like Lucy Crawford, known for writing the definitive history of the White Mountains and White Mountain Settlement, using the voice of her husband, Ethan Allen Crawford. Cutter of the Crawford Path, wrestler of bears, carrier of injured lady hikers. So Lucy arrived here in the White Mountains in 1817, and she came to take care of her sickly grandfather, Elisa Rosebrook, after his death later that same year, she married her cousin, Ethan, and they were given this inn to run, which pretty quickly burned down, and they were displaced, and eventually moved farther down into Crawford Notch, where most people associate their name and their, their family's name. They ended up living right at the top of Crawford Notch, and Ethan would go on to build his famous footpath, Crawford Bath in 1819. And though a true White Mountain pioneer, Lucy took care of the inn. She gave birth 10 times. She survived these White Mountain winters for decades. A hiker, she was not. Not for lack of desire. She did want to climb Mount Washington someday. There were just so many other things to do. So instead, she watched three sisters depart the inn at Crawford Notch. Eliza, Harriet, and Abigail Austin, all of uh, Portland, Maine, and eventually uh, living in, Jeff in Lancaster. They were guided to the summit of Mount Washington by Ethan in 1821 and became the first women to place their feet on the summit of Mount Washington. And Lucy writes about them witnessing all of this happening. And she says they were ambitious and wanted to have the honor of being the first females who placed their feet on this high and now celebrated place. This was a multi-day trip for them so as not to tax these ladies too hard in each day's hike. And Lucy notes this act of heroism ought to confer honor upon them. And she says this, she says it should confer honor, not because they're heroically climbing this mountain as women, but because she says everything was done with so much prudence and modesty by them. There was not a trace or even a chance for reproach or slander, excepting <laughs> by those who thought themselves outdone by these young ladies. So they climbed this great huge mountain, and there were women, but they did it properly. <laughs> it was okay. So in August, of 1825, Lucy finally got her own chance to climb Mount Washington. Her relatives arrived from Boston, and her sister had ambitions to climb the mountain and asked Lucy to join her kind of as a chaperone. And after some discussion, Ethan reluctantly agreed to let her go. Reaching the top, Lucy writes, how delightful. We could look in every direction and view the works of nature as they lay spread before us. We could see towns and villages in the distance, and so clear was the atmosphere that we could distinguish one house from another. But should I attempt to describe the scenery, my pen would fail for want of the language to express my ideas of the grandeur of this place. The Austin sisters, who had been there first, were definitely outliers in terms of pioneering female ascents. They were not known for founding the 4,000 Porter Club or anything like that. <laughs> they didn't seem to be repeat offenders in climbing mountains. And it took more decades for more wool skirts to be shredded by the chrome halts along our White Mountain trails. A first recorded female ascent of any other White Mountain peak beyond the Austin sisters was not recorded until a Mrs. Daniel Patch, you don't even know her real name, climbed Mount Musilaki around 1840. Regardless of the Austin sisters setting this stage, it took a long time before we spread out around the rest of the White Mountains and took a deeper look into the trails. There was little encouragement to do so. One scientific journal 
assesses it as this. If women did insist on making an assent, their dress should be adapted to the service and none should attempt but those in firm health and of sound lungs. Okay, so not such restrictive clothing and decent health. That doesn't seem like such a hurdle. It seems pretty simple, but wait, there's more. In the Saturday Review for February 27, 1875, an unknown author explains the other caveats to be considered. It is extremely desirable indeed that women should be encouraged to take every kind of open air exercise which is suited to their constitutions. We are glad to see ladies riding or skating or climbing mountains in moderation. But we are disposed to draw a very decided line. We should not like to see a lady indulge in any form of violent or disfiguring exercise. <laughs> now, mountain scrambling very easily becomes both. I know this personally. A lady with, a, with skin scorched off her face from exposure to the sun on a snow slope is not pleasing to our eyes. <laughs> Nor do we much approve of any lady indulging in that kind of rough scrambling upon rocks, which, to say the least, involves the adoption of many a ungraceful attitude <laughs> and a probability of considerable destruction to apparel. Expeditions in which they take part should always be so arranged that they can present themselves to gentlemen of their acquaintance without blushing or obvious disfigurements. Ooh, a lot. Okay, so no unseemly postures, no ruining my outfit, yeah. Well, so what was one supposed to do in terms of clothing in the 19th century if you wanted to go for a hike? The 19th century is not exactly known for its sporting goods stores. At first, women had very little to advise them in terms of their clothing for this new sport of mountain climbing. Skirt length seemed to tell you everything you needed to know about a woman's character. And the rules on skirt length, on fabric types, on its poofiness levels, as I like to say, had a really rough collision with white mountain trails, which are basically out there to just destroy every piece of clothing that you own. So fortunately, in 1877, Mrs. William G. Noel, also known as children's author and writer Harriet Putnam Hill Noel, published an article in AMC's Appalachia Journal. And she lays out a few good tips for us all and says that the heavily layered and highly corseted dresses of the late Victorian and post-Civil War era were not going to cut it on the Tucker Man Ravine Trail. <laughs> Instead, Noel encouraged minimalism, minimalism, I put this in quotes, <laughs> keeping the undergarments that were seen as proper and essential, but focusing on this exterior sheathing of your outfit to protect yourself. Though she did eschew full corsets, by, uh, which were then kind of giving way to something called dress reform, uh, and she shouted the praises of the emancipation waist. Not a corset, but kind of a tight vest on which all of your skirt layers were hung. So the outer layers were, let's just say, kind of complicated. The best way that she thought to retain your modesty was to still wear a skirt, but maybe you could get away with a short skirt, maybe up to the knee. And then poofy trousers would be worn underneath the skirt to still cover up your legs. Essentially, for this time period, what we're talking about here is a bathing suit. This is the full body covering, Turkish style bathing costume of the times. And it looked a little bit like this. Still completely covered, still very modest, beyond reproach. Though, can you imagine hiking in something like this? This is multiple layers of wool. If it gets wet, it's going to be pretty heavy and draggy. Uh, and this was only to be employed in the deep woods. When you were off on the trail somewhere away from civilization, if you 
emerged back into civilized territory, you were to be carrying a full-length skirt with you to put on over all of this, so that you'd be covering up any, un, any unseemly body parts like recognizable leg shapes. <laughs> so here are a few bathing suits in action uh, up on the Cutler River, probably sometime around the 1920s, I suspect. So you can see the women have these very wet, saggy skirts on over their ankle-length um, trousers, <laughs> which doesn't look that great, but I'm sure it's summer, it's hot, it would probably be fine. Uh, Noel's article is one of the very, very few pieces of written advice that you're going to find to address this question of, of your costume. And bathing suits were, as she rationalized, about as good as could be expected for the time. If you are allowed to wear one of these on a busy beach, it must be acceptable in the hills of New Hampshire. But this was all on the cusp of a flood of new advice. Like many things that have to do with fashion, there's not a lot of opinions about it until there are a lot of opinions about things. Marjorie Hearn writes in a retrospective piece that she wrote called Fashion on the Peaks in 1935, and this is one of the illustrations for it here on the left. But she writes, no one cares what men wear climbing. A flannel shirt and old trousers have met their needs throughout the years. But women's mountaineering costume is swayed by the current mode and consequently presents much more diversity. So the tricks and trappings of getting all of this right start to change through the end of the 19th century, but long, modest skirts remain this staple item. Fortunately, there's one other easy tactic that you can use when battling the long skirt. Uh, you could take the entire skirt and pin the hem of it to your waist. And this is what uh, Mary Chowska is doing in this little drawing right here. She has her whole skirt pulled up around to her waist and pinned, and it makes this kind of giant sack around your waist, but it keeps the skirt up and out of the undergrowth, and it could be let back down at the end of the trail. So she is seen here scrambling up a mountainside and collecting botanical specimens at the, at the same time. So she's kind of got herself organized. The other convenience of this method is that this giant sack around your waist is essentially one enormous pocket. <laughs> Imagine the 19th century, they are so far ahead of us in putting pockets in women's clothing. It's amazing. <laughs> and you could put stuff down there. You could put gear, any little things that you have with you, your compass, your uh, maybe a little rain cloak, you could roll it up and stuff it in there. You could put your snacks and your lunch inside this giant sack that is now around your waist. The only trick was you had to kind of shift it out of the way if you're going to sit down, because otherwise you'd end up with that sort of classic backpack squish sandwich, uh, which is definitely no good. So the development of serviceable mountain outfit for women, these emancipation ways, these other freedoms that are coming along at the end of the 19th century, all converged kind of at the same time that the Appalachian Mountain Club was founded in 1876. And we were accepting of women right from the very start. We knew their capabilities, we knew they were great on trails, there was nothing they couldn't conquer, and we were really confident in their abilities as hikers. By the time of our founding, there was already a huge community of women hikers here in the White Mountains in particular. And they were exploring, they were being outspoken map makers and cartographers and trail layers. A couple of the most outspoken were the Pichowskas and the Cooks, hailing from Hoboken, New Jersey, sisters Edith and Lucia Cook Pichowska, along with their brother Eugene B. Cook and Lucia's daughter Marion took up summer residence in the White Mountains in 1872. They were early explorers of the Mahoosic Range in particular, and they were probably the first women on Bald Cap, Mount Ingalls, Mount Gusai, and Mount Carlo. And this is Marion and her mother Lucia in 1885, not in trail dress, just looking very proper in their living room. 
Intrepid botanists, artists, map makers, writers, these women contributed not only skill in hiking, but tremendous amounts of knowledge about the White Mountains and the outdoor community in general. And their pure joy and their experiences and love for this place really shine through. So this is one of the pieces that's in the exhibition upstairs. And I think it gives you a really good glimpse of the ruggedness and uh, the character of the mountains in general. It's by Fanny Robertson Thurston. And it's a watercolor piece, which also speaks to me as a watercolor artist. I really see a, a very, very solid technique in her, in her work in particular. But it's a, an image of the imp, which is a rock formation in Finca Notch, which at the time that she was probably painting this in the 19th century, didn't have the greatest road. It was pretty far out there. It was more of a, had more of a wilderness character than I think it does today with our nicely paved road. Um, and she shows how sort of wild and scenic this place is. And we start to see women going further and further out into the White Mountains through the end of the 19th century. So in 1882, women were exploring even farther out there into the more trailless <laughs> and rugged parts of the White Mountains. AMC's counselor of trails, Augustus E. Scott, arranged in 1882 a week-long traverse of the Pemigewasset wilderness. Not finding any men who wanted to join him at all, <laughs> he gladly accepted the offer of three women who offered to join his little expedition. Charlotte Ricker, the first to sign up, was a special correspondent for the White Mountain Echo. Next was Dr. Laura M. Potter, Porter, sorry, a practicing women's doctor in Boston. And finally, 22-year-old Martha F. Whitman. Martha was already an accomplished hiker, and she was a published writer, too. The third issue of Appalachian carries a fantastic article that she wrote about thrashing her way through the wet, cold trees of Tuckerman Ravine before she and her party clawed their way to the summit of Mount Washington in the dark. Uh, it's a fantastic article. She talks about just boldly hopping rock to rock and getting mired down in the firm bolts and you know, it's, it's all in a good day's fun for her, which makes it sound like we'd be friends <laughs> if she were alive. So the 1882 trip with Augusta Scott started out uh, in Twin Mountain, and over the course of the next seven days with three ladies, Scott himself and two male guides, they thrashed their way over South Twin, North Twin, Geo, Mount Vaughn, and Vaughn Cliff, all the way out to Thoreau Falls, and eventually emerged in Crawford Notch. This is a long trip, and there are hardly any trails in this area at this date, so there was a lot of bushwhacking, depending on line of sight, getting lost, getting separated, and lost. Um, they had a lot of adventures on this. And Ricker published a three-part account in White Mountain Echo and stated that fatigue, privation, and exposure necessarily attend explorations. And to the endurance of these hardships, few ladies are equal. Those accompanying the survey on this trip are exceptional women and possess powers of endurance to which many men are strangers. <laughs> and the interesting thing is she, she talks about how heroic they were, but she actually dropped out of the trip early because she wasn't quite up to it. <laughs> it, it kind of kicked her around this, this whole hike. Um, but she got through most of it and wrote these wonderful uh, essays about their journey. So these first generations of women hikers show the possibilities of freedom to the outdoors to those coming up after them. One among this next generation, this 20th century uh, hiking generation, was Grace Harishoff. And if anybody here is into yachts, <laughs> Uh, the Harishoff Yacht Company of Rhode Island, which I think still exists today. Uh, she was part of that family. So she comes from a long line of yacht builders. <laughs> but she was an avid, avid, avid outdoors person and took hundreds of hikes here in the White Mountains and left 
hundreds of pages of journal entries, which we now have in the ANSI archives. They're fascinating to read. Um, they're poetical, they're funny, they're serious, uh, and there are about half a dozen of them. So like many of her predecessors, she shares the aesthetic highlights of her trips, uh, the things that she's seen in the mountains. She, she writes in poetic, ebullient language, and they're just beautiful. So this entry from 1910, during a multi-day trip through the Carter Range and the Presidentials, starts out, another wonderful day. Was awakened at five and saw a sunrise that I must never forget. Carter lay across the east, deep, dark, blue, cold, without detail. Above, the great, bewildering sea of glowing orange pulsated, merging into palest blue overhead. Across the intervening mass of green trees lived this mass of vital color. The knee of Mount Jefferson, with all its trees picked to stink and green and the clear young light of dawn, was flushed with tenderest rose that seemed to envelop every object to the west. Ah, so lovely. <laughs> At the same time, our dear Grace is ruthlessly precise in her journals about mileage, roots, observations about the terrain, the weather, and most importantly, food. This is another person that I think I would be friends with <laughs> if she were around. So in this same journal where she speaks so poetically about the dawn, she notes, uh, she makes notes about the food for six people for a three-day trip like this. One loaf of bread per meal was ample, but one slice of bacon a piece and only three meals of it was not sufficient. Bacon is necessary in cooking for the sake of the fat to fry it. One pound of butter was right for the seven meals, but we used cheese on our bread a good deal and had some sandwiches for two dinners, all prepared. For breakfast, for breakfast we had cereal, one package, cream of wheat, coffee, toast, donuts, bacon. We used true milk, of which we had two cans, it was excellent. For lunch, we had sardines, hardtack, bread, odds and ends. At night, soup was a staple, with cheese sandwiches, toast, cocoa, and fruit. There was no bacon at supper, <laughs> as we were saving it for breakfast, but we could have eaten more. The last breakfast was the same as on the second day. Our last meal, dinner, we ate nearly everything left. <laughs> Mostly, we'd be friends because of her love of bacon. <laughs> Grace was part of this bright, hearty, adventurous coterie of women with really great appetites that was in the White House at the beginning of the 20th century. And fortunately for her and others, these types of trips were becoming more popular and way more acceptable for women to participate in. So this new normal didn't escape the notice of the press. This is an article from the winter of 1926. Mm -hmm. Seemingly, it's like the, the 1926 equivalent of clickbait. <laughs> it says, women and knickers invade the White Mountains. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> so the bulk of the article is actually about snowshoeing, learning to snowshoe, and what the mountains are like in winter. But the author just can't help himself in noting that the, the primly dressed and carefully gowned ladies who arrived from Boston gave little or no hint of what they looked like as they struggled a few days ago up the sides of Thorn, Spruce, Iron, and Black Mountains, so here in Jackson, to say nothing of the long pull to Carter's Notch and the hard ascent of Mount Clinton above Crawford's Intervale. So this is, this is your typical uh, winter snowshoeing outfit. She looks very determined. <laughs> Besides the article, there is this, uh, this wonderful photo. And a hundred people took part in this trip, which was a 50th anniversary trip for the ASC. They stayed at the Iron Mountain House here in Jackson. And they climbed all the nearby peaks by day. They didn't stop there. They also danced all night, <laughs> enjoyed music, and held, quote, a masquerade ball of exceptional distinction. These 
kinds of week-long hiking, dancing, musical, masquerade extravaganzas were becoming an annual tradition with the club. And it hired private train cars to get folks from Boston and other city centers up here to the North Country. They even convinced some of these inns that had never opened in the wintertime before to open up and create small heated spaces to accommodate folks. Otherwise, they would have been closed uh, in the cold seasons. So one of our exhibition painters braved the cold here. So this is a piece by Marion Howard. She joined the AMC in 1911 and exhibited her work at AMC's Boston headquarters in 1913. It's probably pretty likely that she was on some of these winter trips here to the White Mountains. I haven't checked the logbooks to see if she was on any of them yet, but I, I have my suspicions that she was. So we can imagine that maybe she was bringing her paints, possibly she was bringing sketchbooks and gleaning some inspiration. While she was out hiking every single peak in the area, um, she was probably also imagining these aerial, moody, atmospheric paintings of hers as well. So the timing of this, this invasion of women <laughs> in the White Mountains is perfect for athletic women who are, are coming up and being introduced to the outdoors within AMC. This really sporty set uh, of girls could try their hand at even more rugged activities like rock climbing. The AMC jumped on this this rock climbing bandwagon very, very early in its creation. And it hosted day trips all around these boulders around Boston to get you in shape and trained and, and learn how to climb so that you could conquer more complicated routes up here in the White Mountains. So a couple of these early climbers included uh, Margaret Mason Culburn and her husband, Willard. Soon, she recruited all kinds of other women to join in and become rock climbers themselves. Uh, Elizabeth Knowlton and Miriam O'Brien Underhill all came up through this time period and were learning to um, climb in the Boston area and then here in the White Mountains. And not, a lot of them were going off and climbing in the Alps as well. So this was sort of their training ground. Miriam Underhill in particular loved to climb here in the White Mountains. She, she learned to do all of her mountaineering and climbing here. And they were her playground, they were her gymnasium. She moved on to the Alps in 1925. In Europe, she climbed with parties that were led exclusively by men. And later on, she writes, very early I learned that the person who invariably climbs behind a good leader may never really learn mountaineering at all. The one who goes up first on the rope has even more fun as he solves the immediate problems of technique, tactics, and strategy as they occur. I did realize that if women were really to lead, that is, to take the entire responsibility for the climb, there couldn't be any man in the party at all. <laughs> so she invented this term, manless climbing. <laughs> <laughs> and with Alice de Mesme, she climbed the Grand Pont in France in 1929. After this feat, French climber Etienne Brule stated that the Grepon has disappeared. Now that it has been done by two women alone, no self-respecting man can undertake it. <laughs> <laughs> Miriam would go on to face feats of, of mountain greatness, and she would, would become the third member of the AFC's 4,000 Foot Club after it formed in 1957. She and her husband, Robert, would go on to do all of the 4,000 footers in winter, just three years later. Other extraordinary firsts of this pre-war uh, mountain period for folks like Miriam were women like Florence Murray Clark, who's here on the right, uh, who's pioneering solo for female first ascent of Mount Washington by dog sled, happened in 19. On April 4th, she set out alone with a five-dog team, a sled loaded with 200 pounds of provision, and enough grit to make it to the summit of Mount Washington and back. Another of this generation is uh, one of our artists, Mary Boyd Allen, who's also upstairs uh, in painting form. 
Although she came to painting and became an outdoors person later in life, a 1934 article in the Art Digest shows that she was grabbing the outdoor life by the horns as soon as she got into it. They state that she, quote, does not hesitate to ride miles over rough trails and live in isolated cabins to get material for her painting. She became more, more known as a Western painter, but we have a few examples of her uh, White Mountain work as well. So a few of our women painters upstairs were, were visitors. They passed through the region, like Alan, and others arrived and stayed for good. One of those of note is Anne Carrie Bradley, who cut kind of the classic artist figure. She would ride around her uh, town of Freiburg, Maine, on her bicycle with her painting kit strapped to her back, uh, probably wearing a beret, and painting around town with a smock and sometimes a wide brimmed hat. So her color choices reflect uh, a little bit of her Fauvist influences. She trained extensively under a number of um, art teachers of the time and soaked in some of these bright, wild colors that she was being exposed to. But she was a really kind of shy and private person in life. Um, didn't talk much, painfully shy, never got married, lived on her own as an artist. And she was seen as this tiny, quiet little figure that had this amazing spark of color and vibrancy. Just Kind of oozing out of her. So this long line of White Mountain women is an inspiration for all of us today. And it, and it brings things full circle when I mention a few contemporary female figures that live among us here in the White Mountains and have done some pretty incredible things. So there's Laura Waterman, who many of you have probably heard who with Natalie Davis and Debbie O'Neill became the first women to complete an all-women's winter presidential traverse in 1988. Laura's played a really significant role in the conservation movement and its history through the many books that she published with her husband, Guy Waterman, on backwoods, backwoods ethics and the Northeast, uh, Northeast mountaineering history. She's still an active conservationist. I know some folks have just visited her yesterday. Um, and she lives just across the river in Vermont. Rebecca Oreskes, here in the middle, yelling, <laughs> who started working at ANC's Pink of Notch Camp in 1979. And she became the hut master of the Lakes of the Clouds Hut in 1983. Later, she joined the Forest Service as the only woman on the timber marking crew. She stuck with the Forest Service for uh, the next number of decades and just retired in 2013 after 25 years. She oversaw programs like recreation, wilderness management, public affairs, conservation education, and heritage, all as part of the White Mountain National Forest leadership team. Sue Johnson of Littleton, who in 2016 became the first person to complete the grid in a single year, that is hiking all of the New Hampshire 4,000 footer peaks in every month of the year. She had already kind of become the first woman and the third person overall to complete the grid in any amount of time in 2003. But in 2016, she did it all in one calendar year. Katie Scheid, one of my personal favorites. Uh, she is a, a, an AMC Huts alumni. And she lives and runs professionally as a trail racer in the Alps these days. But she came uh, back over across the pond in 2019 and became the fastest known time completer of the Huts Traverse. So that's running about 52 miles through all eight of the AMC's Huts. And she did it in 12 hours, 23 minutes, and six seconds. <laughs> Sally Nikian, a dear friend of mine and another AMC former colleague, um, she is a local sled dog musher, and she's the proprietress of Shady Pines Sled Dogs over in Shelburne, New Hampshire. She runs her dogs in races up to 250 miles here in the Northeast and in the Midwest and even up into Canada. She also works
works for the Conservation Fund, so she protects huge tracts of land here in New Hampshire and Vermont. So all of these amazing women that have come up through this long line of them um, today. Hiking, camping, exploring, living, working, painting here in one of the most unique places in the country. So let us honor them by continuing to do the things that we love to do here as women. But we will still heed the advice of John E. Gould in his seminal 1877 book, How to Camp Out. As to having women along on your next camping trip, he thinks that we should know a few things. He starts out, it is a thoroughly practical goal for them to do so. They must have a wagon and do none of the heavy work. Their gowns must not reach quite to the ground, and all their clothing, clothing must be used loose and easy. Of course, there must be gentlemen in the party, and it may save some annoyance to have at least one of the ladies well nigh middle-aged. <laughs> ladies must be cared for more tenderly than men. If they are not well, the wagon should go back for them at the end of day's march. Of course, uh, shelter tents are not to be recommended for them, nor are two blankets sufficient bed clothing. They ought not to be compelled to go any definite distance, but after having made their day's walk, let the tents be pitched. Rainy weather is particularly unpleasant to ladies. <laughs> Deserted houses, schoolhouses, sawmills, or barns should be sought for them when a storm is brewing. <laughs> they ought not to rough it <laughs> so much as young men expect to. Consequently, they should be better protected from the wet and the cold. So here are the White Mountains. Women have had a long history of busting these many myths about our abilities and watching us ramble up rugged trails, camp out in all weather, and climb every single mountain that can be found, be it 1821 or 2021, how could there, there be any doubt that this is where we belong? Thank you. <laughs>
uh, Rebecca wrote the essay. She was kind to um, do that for us, and it's beautiful. Um, so you'll find that. There's some words from Warren in there, and there's a lot of interesting information, never mind the bios and a whole lot of detail <coughs> filled with a professional photograph um, of, of the paintings that we have in our collection. Also, Rebecca's um, going to be upstairs, and we do have a limit of 20 people. Someone will be counting, but thank you so <laughs> very much for attending tonight. Thank you all the boys.